Let us pray. Our most gracious Father, continually we pray, open our eyes that we may see. Open our ears that we may hear. Open our hearts that we might turn and repent and believe in your Son, Jesus. Enable our faith to ever grow, that we would grow in our trust, and in growing in our trust, know more deeply the power of your working in us, to know that transformative work of Christ on our behalf, that he is working in us. Enable us to always follow you, and give us strength, O Lord, to endure whatever may come, that you may be made known through us as you have sent us forth. All of this we ask through that very same Lord Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you, Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. As I said earlier, we're still in the midst of the Easter season. And so we continue to shout, Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, Alleluia. For many, they only say that on Easter Day, but we continue to cry out with that saying because we are ever joyful that Christ is truly risen. But something struck me as I was studying this text and looking at what is happening with the disciples and with Thomas, and with Jesus suddenly appearing to them. It struck me that so often when I talk about transformation or renewal, <clears throat> it may be that for some of us, I know for myself, who's, as I've been a Christian for many years, and some of you have been Christians for longer than I've been alive, and some of you have been Christians since the day you were born. You've never known a time when you didn't know Jesus. And so this sense of transformation that we are continually called into lacks something, it feels like. You never have this moment where you feel as though you have ever not been faithful you don't have any major problems in your life, no major sins that you're trying to overcome. You don't have something like the prostitute's witness, her story of conversion, or the drug dealer's story of transformation of when they heard the gospel for the first time and it suddenly impacted them and completely renewed their lives and they abandoned their old way of living that everyone would look upon and say, well, of course they're sinners. And of course, when we do that, we'd be little the reality of sin in all of our lives. That all of us live with sin. All of us struggle against sin. All of us walk this path. It may just be that our sins just aren't as quote unquote glamorous as other sins. They're not the kind of sins that capture someone's attention when we talk about Jesus. But here we continually look back to what the Gospels reveal to us. That regardless of where we are, God comes to us. He draws near to all people to make himself known. That in fact, I would say God comes to us in Jesus Christ in spite of where we are. That God comes to us in spite of where we are. That we may be in a place of utter separation from God or we may be in a place of sort of nearness to God. But in spite of that, God comes to us because in neither position do we deserve God to come to us whether we feel like we're doing well and drawing near to God or whether we feel like we're a million miles away. In neither of those places do we deserve for God to sully himself, so to speak, to come down into the muck and mire of our lives and give us Jesus. And yet he does. And why does he do, do that? Why does he bring about such a glorious thing of revealing Jesus to us in spite of our position? It's so that he can give us peace. So that he can send us out. And so that he can give us continual faith. And that's what we see happening in this passage today. We see God come to Jesus. Or we see Jesus come to the disciples. That God sends Jesus to his disciples. Despite the fact that they are all rebels. Despite the fact that they are all traitors in one way or another. For they have all abandoned Jesus. And yet here they are, all save for Thomas, gathered on that evening of the first day. 
And what happens on that evening of the first day? Well, we discover a new peace that leads to a new sending. You hear that? Christ gives us a new peace that will lead us into a new sending. And so there in John chapter 20, verse 19, St. John tells us that the doors were locked on that first day of the week, that the disciples were fearful of the Jews, and so they were in hiding. They were hiding behind the locked doors of the upper room. One commentator did make a, what I felt was a pretty insightful comment of like, these people who just crucified Jesus, it's not like these doors are going to keep them away from you. If they really want to get you, they can break down those doors easily enough especially since they're still in Jerusalem. And they are the known disciples of Jesus. And so they're in hiding, but it's almost, what's the point? What's the point of hiding at this point? They could come and get you if they really wanted to right now. But nonetheless, they are there hiding because they are fearful. They have a real and abiding fear that they could break in at any moment. But someone else breaks in on them. Not through the doors, not through the windows, not through some removing of ceiling panels to drop down out of the ceiling. Jesus just simply appears. St. John says that Jesus came and stood among them. Can you imagine it? They're all just sitting around the table, having dinner, discussing the events of what they've been hearing about. That the women are there telling them about Jesus being at the tomb alive. St. Peter and St. John reflecting on the fact that they ran to the tomb. John beating Peter, by the way, as John makes it a point to tell us. And Jesus wasn't there. They saw the crumpled grave clothes and the face cloth folded up and set down in the corner. And then the disciples from Emmaus suddenly bursting in on them a little bit ago, crying out, we've met Jesus. He walked with us to Emmaus and then had dinner with us. And when he broke bread, suddenly our eyes were open. And he vanished. They're all confused. They're all struggling. What does all of this mean? And then suddenly, bam, Jesus is there and he says, peace be with you. Jesus is greeting his disciples with a word of peace. If you've been reading through the Gospel of John by chance, you know that peace is some of the last words Jesus spoke to his disciples before his betrayal. That he was speaking to them that he would leave them his peace. And then he was taken away. He was betrayed by Judas and ultimately by all of them in their abandonment. And yet here on this evening he comes and brings peace to them. And many of us know that that peace be with you is a general greeting. It's a general greeting for the Jewish people that when they saw someone they'd yell out peace be with you. We hear that. In the book of Ruth, as Boaz goes out to his field, he tells his workers, peace be with you, and they respond, peace be with you. It's a general greeting, but yet there is more than meets the eye in that greeting. Much like when we share the peace with each other later on, it's not just a happy, clappy feeling. It's not meant to be a generic greeting. There's more there. It's a type of prayer that we're offering on behalf of this person, a benediction, in fact, upon the person being greeted. And the days before Jesus is one of bestowing on the greeted God's blessings and kindness. Kind of a, may the you know, may you know the fullness of God's mercy and salvation in his kingdom. That could be an understanding of it. But it was a future sense of knowing. God's peace be with you throughout your days and ultimately in the end. And so coming from Jesus, him saying peace be with you, it's amplified to infinity. It's a blessing, yes, to the everyday Israelite, but now it's no longer about future blessing. It is about blessing in the here and now. <coughs> On Jesus' very lips being God in the flesh. <coughs> and not just ordinary flesh now, but in resurrected flesh. He is one who has endured the privations of the wrath and justice of God on man's behalf. Now, this word of peace on Jesus' lips is something new. It's a living kind of peace. It's a peace that they haven't yet truly known. They weren't able to know it until Jesus' death and resurrection had been accomplished. 
It is the fullness of Jesus' victory in those simple words. Peace be with you. And that new peace leads to a new understanding for the disciples. It leads to a new sending. For as soon as he says, peace be with you, he knows what they need to see. They need to see the nail marks in his hands, the scars of the thorns upon his forehead, the spear wound in his side. He shows all of that to them. And they rejoice in seeing this because now everything has come circle for them. Everything Jesus has said makes sense. Peace is given to them. It's bestowed upon them through what Jesus has done for them. The fullness of God's peace showers down upon their hearts and their souls, their minds and their bodies so that they can be renewed. And in the midst of that rejoicing, Jesus speaks peace to them again. And now that new peace that they have received, this new kind of peace is preparing them for a new sending. For Jesus says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Jesus speaks peace to them and he confirms that peace upon them because without peace they can't do what he is about to call them to. They will not be able to endure the work. Their sending, our sending, depends upon this new peace from Jesus. It rests upon the new peace that Christ has won for them. The new sending must have this as the foundation. It's a future peace that has been driven into the present to borrow some of the word pictures that N.T. Wright uses sometimes, that it's a future thing that is driven down into the present reality by the resurrection of Jesus. His death is what has made that peace possible in the here and now. And in the here and now, it makes the disciples capable of being sent into the world. Jesus speaks with the Father's authority. As the Father sent him, he now is acting as the Father by sending others. He now sends them forth with authority. The Father gave authority to the Son, and the Son now sends with His authority His representatives, who are thus representatives of the Father on the Son's behalf. This new peace leads to the sending forth. And now this peace, this new peace which has led to this new sending, it will lead to a new breeze that evening. One of the pictures also that many writers talk about on this first evening is it's in many ways the first evening of the new creation. Jesus is raised on the first day of the week because that first day of the week is the eighth day of creation and thus becomes new creation. That God started creating on a Sunday all the way until Friday and then on Saturday he rested. But now Jesus' death on that sixth day or on that fifth day of the week, no, the sixth day of the week, <laughs> excuse me, Jesus' crucifixion on that sixth day of the week is a mirror of Adam and Eve's creation, that he deals with the sin that they will eventually bring into the world on that last day of old creation. And then he rests in the tomb. And then on that first day of the week, the eighth day, he raises up to new life. He is raised into new life, and that is what we're seeing here. This new sinning will create a new world with a new kind of breeze in it. Because Jesus then says, receive the Holy Spirit as he breathes upon them. It's a new breeze that is set forth here. N.T. Wright made a connection that I'd never thought about before. God came to Adam and Eve on the night of their betrayal, on the night of their first sin, on the evening breeze. During the evening breeze, he came. They heard the sound of God in the garden and they hid themselves. The reason that I completely have always missed this is because, for whatever reason, our English translations chose to translate that word ruach when it says that they heard the sound of God in the ruach of the day. Ruach is the Hebrew word for wind or breath or breeze or spirit. And it's understood there in that particular context that is speaking of an evening breeze, an evening cool that comes upon the day and that God is there. But I think there's a word play there that N.T. Wright picks up on that it's the evening breeze that makes known that God is there. It is though the breeze is speaking of God is here to Adam and Eve. And they hear the sound of God. They hear his voice on the wind 
through the wind, and he is coming to them, and so they hide. But here on the evening of this new creation week, this first day of new creation, a new breeze blows, and it comes from Jesus himself. Not from God the Father in heaven, but through Jesus, this new breeze blows upon the disciples. On this new evening, on this first evening, new creation is beginning, and thus a new breeze is necessary. That is one new breeze revealed, as one old breeze, I should say, revealed to Adam and Eve that God was in the garden and coming to speak with them of their sin. Now, a new breeze blows as Jesus creates new people for himself to send out into the world with that very breeze to send it forth, to send forth the Spirit through them into this world. But even more, another connection to that moment of creation The same verb that is used for Jesus breathing on the disciples is the very verb that describes what the Lord God does to Adam after he formed him from the dust. He breathed into his nostrils new life. And so in a way, a similar kind of life, a greater kind of life is breathed onto the disciples in this moment. Now the disciples received the fullness, you could say, of the Spirit at Pentecost 50 days later. But here is the giving of the Spirit to them. They are truly receiving the Holy Spirit on this first evening. And they will become stewards and ministers of new creation on God's behalf. As Jesus breathes on them, he says, receive the Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. This is the calling that the disciples are now given. They are called to go out into the world to proclaim forgiveness or to withhold forgiveness. They're empowered to do this act on Jesus' behalf. Now, I know that we probably get nervous to hear of these, this phrase, you can forgive sins. Whosoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whosoever you withhold, they are withheld. I can hear people saying, but only God can forgive sins. So many people cry out when they hear Jesus give this ability to his disciples to give this ministry. I should say not so much an ability, but a ministry to the disciples. Only God can forgive. Just as the Pharisees cried out against Jesus so often when he said, your sins are forgiven, they say to themselves, only God can forgive. And they are right. Only God can truly forgive us. Only God can excise our sins from us. And that is why Jesus can say it, because he is truly God. He is true God and true man here on earth for us and he forgives our sins through his death and resurrection. And so only God can forgive sins is right in a certain way. However, what it doesn't take into account is that Jesus has the authority to extend that forgiveness to others. In this passage, he gives an authority to his disciples through his name and through his power by giving them the Holy Spirit in this way He is giving them the ability to forgive sins in His name. They are to go out and to be stewards and ministers, ambassadors of God into this world to speak of forgiveness, but also to speak of a withholding of that forgiveness. And I think that's a key for helping us understand what Jesus means by saying the disciples can forgive sins, is in the sense of their ability to withhold forgiveness. That's the key. Because why would they withhold forgiveness from someone? What might lead them to deny saying, I forgive you in the name of Jesus? Underneath all of that is that reality of repentance. That if an individual comes to them and is refusing to repent of his sins, then they cannot give them forgiveness because that forgiveness would not be received. That person is refusing to have forgiveness flow into them because they refuse to recognize their own sinfulness. The one whose sins are withheld, the one for whom forgiveness is withheld, is the one who has refused to confess those very sins. When we refuse to confess, we reject forgiveness. We reject any offer of forgiveness. We cut ourselves off. And so that withholding of forgiveness is more of a refusal of forgiveness. That it is ready to be poured out upon you, but in your refusal, in your hardness of heart to confess your sin... You drive away that offered gift of forgiveness and thus your sins become left upon you. That is what the disciples' authority is, I think. 
Now, the person who is refusing to repent can't receive forgiveness. They can't be changed until the Spirit has worked that repentance in them. And the person to whom they say, I forgive you your sins in the name of Jesus Christ is the one who is repenting and is open and receiving of the word of God that says that Jesus has died for their sins. Jesus has undone your sins. He has broken death and hell. And they no longer have authority over you. Only Jesus has authority. The Father has authority over you. And he says you are forgiven for the sake of Jesus. Repentance is part and parcel of receiving that forgiveness from Jesus through his disciples. And we hear this every week in the absolution. We're reminded that repentance is necessary to receive forgiveness. To be in that realm of forgiveness. Every week after the confessions of sin, I say, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father who in His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to Him, have mercy upon you. The form of absolution that we have here in the Anglican Church in this particular service is one of almost a prayer of God to forgive you of your sins. But it always has that reminder built into it of the one who truly repents and has true faith is the one who can receive that forgiveness. So merely mouthing a confession of sin without faith, without repentance does not mean you automatically get the gift of forgiveness. Because you can't get that gift because out of hand, without faith, you're rejecting the gift. And yet, God in His great mercy pours an abundance of forgiveness upon the one who believes in the very moment He needs it. That's why that one is confessing his sin. He needs forgiveness. He needs grace. And so he cries out, Look at my sin, O God. I am a sinner in need of forgiveness, in need of mercy, in need of the salvific hand of Jesus upon me. Jesus has dealt with that one's sin already. And in realizing it, that one has no reason to resist, to resist confession because that one knows that God is ready and able to forgive through Jesus. To work forgiveness through the absolution because there is faith to receive that reality. Now what I'm not saying when I speak of having, of lacking faith and repentance when you pray a prayer or confession. I'm not saying I don't feel like I don't believe. I don't feel like I believe today. And if I don't feel like I believe then I can't be forgiven. The absolution and Jesus' words here and God's promises to give forgiveness to those who are truly repentant isn't dependent on my feelings. It's not based on your feelings. I can pray the prayer of confession without having that feeling of sorrow per se. But still, deep down, I believe I am a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. And it's not the feelings that are the belief. It is the pure and simple faith that is there, that trust in the work of Jesus, despite how I feel, despite what might be on the surface in that moment. There's that deep inward sense of the need of forgiveness that only comes through Jesus. That is what makes me pray the prayer of confession even when I don't feel like I believe. It's because there's that deep inward need for cleansing, that deep inward faith that exists and is reaching out and clinging to Jesus. Even if I don't feel like I believe in that moment, I do believe. Even if I'm not feeling it. My feelings are not what are important in that moment. Now I'm not saying that feelings don't matter at all. If you never have a sense of sorrow, then let's talk about that. Let's dig down some and figure out why are there no why is there never any sorrow for sin? But they're not the bedrock necessity. They are part of our created being and thus are kind of a barometer that can help us on the path of the Christian life. But they are not the path itself. They help us understand where we are on the path. And this new faith ultimately leads to a new breeze. This new breeze leads to a renewed faith for the disciples. That as they are sent forth to pronounce forgiveness, they exercise that with Thomas. He wasn't there in the room with them. He didn't witness Jesus and he is very much in the same place that they are that first day. We all 
pick on Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas, but the disciples were just as much as doubters as he was. He just happened to voice it in a much stronger way than they did. They refused to believe the women who told them of Jesus' resurrection. They doubted the accounts of everyone else. They themselves had to see Jesus' nail wounds. They had to see all of it themselves because Jesus showed it to them. And so in a way, we do a disservice to Thomas by calling him Doubting Thomas, but he is recorded as being extremely outspoken of, I will not believe until I touch him, until I touch the scars, until I touch the nail wounds, until I touch the wounded side. I can't believe. He refuses to believe until he touches those nail-scarred hands. And do the disciples kick him out? Do they abandon him? Do they leave him behind and say, well, whatever, good luck with that, St. Thomas? No, they continue to keep him there with them in their midst. They continue revealing to him the words of Jesus, I think, throughout that week. They continue pointing out that Jesus has given us the Spirit to forgive sins and to withhold sins. To forgive and to withhold forgiveness. He has called us to continue his task, Thomas. How can you not believe right now? Everything is accomplished, but Thomas continues in his doubt for that whole week. And on that eighth day later, which would line up with today, in fact, if the resurrection happened last Sunday, today would be the evening that St. Thomas encounters Jesus. And Jesus shows up and he speaks that new peace again in order to bring forth the new breeze that will renew St. Thomas's faith. Remember, Thomas trusted in Jesus. He believed in him. He knew him so deeply. In John 11... As Jesus finally sets his face to go to Bethany to bring about the healing of Lazarus, Thomas is the one who cries out, let us go to and die with him. He knew that Jesus was moving toward his own death by going to Bethany. That is what he knew was going to happen, and he was more than willing to go and die with Jesus. But that faith crumbled as he saw Jesus actually die. But deep down, he stays with the disciples because there's an incipient hope. There's an incipient kind of faith dwelling there this, that gets renewed when he witnesses Jesus. Jesus preaches, peace be upon you. Peace be with you. And Thomas is renewed. Jesus shows him the nail wounds. And he says, put your hand here and see. Place your finger in my hand. Place it in my side. Believe in me now. Many commentators assume that Thomas did fill Jesus' hands and his side and his feet. I don't know. St. John doesn't say so. St. John just says as soon as Jesus says that and shows him the wounds, Thomas falls down and cries out, My Lord and my God. He believes his faith is renewed because of that new breeze of new peace upon him. He lets go of everything and believes in Jesus. That is the calling that we have this day to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, to believe that he is the resurrected Lord who even now bears those dazzling wounds in his hands, the dazzling scars upon his forehead of that crown of thorns that was pressed upon his skull. He bears those on our behalf today, even in the resurrected glorified state of his body. They bear the wounds that wins our salvation. And that, I think, is what Jesus means when he says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That through that pouring out of the Spirit, through his disciples, through later the bishops and the priests that are appointed to work instead of the disciples, after the disciples die, after the original apostles die, the bishops and the priests, they go forth carrying that same Spirit, breathing that same Spirit out and proclaiming forgiveness in the name of Jesus. They go out and proclaim the forgiveness of Jesus. In such a way that those who haven't seen are brought to faith. They are brought into belief. They are brought into trusting the work of Jesus. They release people from their sins. The people are able to be freed by the words of the disciples and apostles and the bishops and priests of the early church. All the way down to us today. When I proclaim peace and forgiveness over you, I'm exercising that same gift because it has come down to me through the apostles and through the disciples and through the bishops of the church I've been placed here 
in the bishop's stead to proclaim forgiveness to each and every one of you that you might be changed, that you might be renewed in your faith continually. It's not a gift I exercise lightly. Every week I delight in proclaiming that forgiveness because I want you to know that you are loved by Christ and that He brings forgiveness to you through those words. And so I stand here to proclaim forgiveness every week so that you might be changed and encouraged and built up into faith. And you likewise... And your personal friendships can proclaim forgiveness to those who struggle, to those whose consciences are vexed by sin, who desire to turn away from sin but can't see that God can forgive them. You can look at them and say, I forgive you for the sake of Jesus of your sins. You are forgiven because of Jesus. Now be healed by His forgiveness. You have that power in your own lives for you bear the Holy Spirit as well. And thus, on a personal level, on a private level, you can proclaim forgiveness to people that you encounter who need to hear the word of forgiveness. And when we come into the church, I have that gift and that opportunity, that blessing to proclaim forgiveness to all who come here. That all might turn and know Jesus, for that is the point of it all, to turn and to know Jesus through the words of forgiveness and the reception of the Holy Spirit. That gives us new peace. And so Jesus meets us despite where we are, in spite of where we are, so that he can bring new peace to us, to bring the Spirit to us as a new kind of breeze, and to bring new faith and renewed faith for us this day. So this day I say, taste and see that the Lord is good, and he is giving you his gifts of life and salvation. He is giving you his gift of peace, that you would know forgiveness and no renewal. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.